Chapter 2. Searchlight. I come from a mining town, but by the time I came along, December 2, 1939, the leading industry in my hometown of Searchlight, Nevada, was no longer mining. It was prostitution. I don't exaggerate. There was a local law that said that you could not have a house of prostitution or a place that served alcohol within so many feet of a school. Once, when it was determined that one of the clubs was in violation of this law, they moved the school. As a boy, I learned to swim at a whorehouse. Nobody in town had ever seen such a fancy in-ground tiled pool in their lives as the pool at the El Rey, or any pool at all for that matter, at least nobody that we knew. The El Rey was the main bordello where I was growing up in Searchlight. Every Thursday afternoon, the whoremonger in town, a kindly bear of a man by the name of Willie Martello, would ask the girls who worked at the El Rey to clear out, and he'd invite the children in town, usually no more than a dozen or so at a time, to swim in his pool. And we would live the life of Riley for a couple of hours, splashing in the azure blue of the whorehouse pool. This was a rare luxury in a hard town. When I was coming up, there were several other brothels in Searchlight, the Crystal Club, Searchlight Casino, Sandy's, 13 in all, and no churches to be found. In my home, we had no religion, none, zero. And when I say none, I don't mean 10% religious. I mean none. It wasn't that my parents were atheists or something. It was that religion just wasn't part of our lives. But Franklin Roosevelt was. In our little home, my mother had a navy blue embroidered pillowcase with a little fringe on it, and she'd put it up on the wall. On it, in bright yellow stitched, it read, We can, we will, we must. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that was my religion. Otherwise, my father's concerns were much more terrestrial, and he spent his time not gazing heavenward, but downward, under the ground, looking for gold. Initially, that was the only reason anybody came to Searchlight. Since the beginning, man has scratched the earth with simple tools to get the richness that lies beneath. Four thousand years before Christ, the Neanderthals mined flint to make weapons, and ever since, when something of value has been found in the ground, men have come running. The strike that created my hometown happened in 1897, when a man named George Frederick Colton found gold at what would be the duplex mine in the middle of town. By the turn of the century, searchlight was booming, but reversals came quick. Within a decade, the town was in a serious decline, and all more than 250,000 ounces of gold had been pulled from the ground at searchlight, half of that before 1909. Thirty years later, with the boom of a distant memory, I was born in my grandmother's house, a two-room shack, delivered by a doctor by the name of Fenlon, who would himself soon leave town for some place more prosperous. It's an interesting man who makes his way to the middle of nowhere, seeking his life and fortune. That's what my grandfather, John Reed, did when he was drawn to searchlight from California just after the turn of the century. And that, of course, is also the story of our country— a certain vagabond spirit in the best sense of the word. The middle of nowhere is a hard place to live, so many of our fathers were drunks, and some of our mothers were as well. When I was a kid, I didn't realize searchlight was the middle of nowhere. I figured everybody on earth lived like we did, and I thought my town was the center of the known universe. The landscape, scarred with hundreds of claims, some active, many abandoned, was so interesting to a boy looking for adventure. All manner of treasure was to be found down those holes, if not actually much gold. Over time, the gold in the ore became harder and harder to find and more expensive to produce. Some of the mining outfits would dig a hole, find nothing there, and immediately dig another hole. And so there are hundreds of holes in the ground in searchlight. Hundreds. Any place you look, there are holes. When I was coming up, people always said, Better be careful of the holes. Better fence some of them. And my dad would say, anybody dumb enough to fall down a hole, they should fall down a hole. During the boom, if a modern convenience existed, it could be found in searchlight. Telephone, telegraph, a doctor, a dentist, a railroad, and electricity, which is astounding considering that much of rural America wouldn't be electrified for decades. Back then, searchlight was bigger than Las Vegas. When I was a boy, it was barely hanging on. 
and we knew nothing of the luxuries that those who came before us had enjoyed on the same spot. Searchlight never became a ghost town, but it sure tried. By the 1940s, the town's regression was almost complete. There wasn't a single telephone in the town. No television set, no telegraph, nothing other than the mail to communicate with the outside world. Unreliable electricity. No doctor, no dentist. You didn't go to the doctor unless you were on your deathbed. And even then, who's going to print the money for you to pay the bill? The isolation and dwindling prospects could put a dent in your pioneer spirit and take a toll on your family. Put the lens a little closer on the Reed house. At the time, I thought our house was really nice, but as I look back, I, I guess it wasn't. First, it is made of railroad ties, and railroad ties are soaked in creosote, oil, to keep the termites out. So this house of ours is as flammable as a house can be, my dad put chicken wire up and added a coat of plaster to make a rough stucco exterior. We had a little tree in our yard for a while. It died. The yard is just rocks. Things don't grow. My brother and I always go in the back door. There's a kitchen, and the kitchen has a wood stove when you come in, right next to the sink, and an electric stove. Not a fancy one, but a stove and a refrigerator. And there's a little room with no door on it. It's where the bathroom should be but it isn't a bathroom. We use an outhouse instead. But my mother stores stuff in the little room. She takes in laundry from the card dealers at the casinos and from the brothels, and this is where she keeps her clothes wringer and her wash soap. Continue the tour into what is called the front room. It's the biggest room in the house, and it's where the radio is. But otherwise, we barely use it because it gets cold in there. The floors are linoleum. But don't leave the room until you look up and see the star on the ceiling, made of rough-cut pieces of wood arranged around the light fixture. It's the handiwork of a guy named Pop Payne, and it's real nice to look at. It really makes the house special. Then come back around to the two tiny bedrooms, and that's it. Now the back bedroom of our place, measuring 8 feet by 11 feet, is the room I share with my little brother Larry, who came along a couple of years after me, Larry lives like a king because, as the youngest, he gets the five-gallon bucket. Me? I have to go to the outhouse, which at night, in the wintertime, seems like it's a mile away. The linoleum floor is like ice. Look closer and you'll see my parents, Harry and Inez Reed. My father is a powerful man, a very good miner, and is very quiet, brooding. He doesn't like much to be around people. Larry and I are quiet like him. Larry is especially quiet, and my father has a special feeling for him. Pop always works, but because of unreliable and unscrupulous bosses, he often doesn't get paid. The checks bounce all the time, but that doesn't seem to bother him too much. I can see him always reading a book, sometimes technical manual, or more likely some dime novel. Never books written by women, that's his prejudice. Only books by men. I wake up in the morning and walk into the kitchen and Pop's sitting at the table drinking strong coffee and escaping into some book, which some people might not expect, since he didn't even finish eighth grade. But don't let his lack of education fool you. He can do anything. He just prefers to work alone, that's all. He's a carpenter. He can do finishing work. He's a blacksmith. He can sharpen steel and picks and saws. He can overhaul an engine of a car. He's a welder. He can walk around a pile of rocks or dirt, observe its height and slope, and calculate its volume in his head. This drives the engineers crazy because they can't figure out how somebody like him can do something like that. He can do anything, but mostly he's a miner. And he can go down in a mine, take a compass, and do underground mapping. That's something the college boys can't figure out either, and Pop just smiles. Like I said, he keeps to himself. We live up on a hill, and if Pop sees somebody coming, he tells us to stay quiet. At nighttime, people come by and call out, Harry, Harry, but my dad won't let us answer the door. Part of it is that all his friends like to drink, and a lot of times he doesn't have any money, and they're already way ahead of him anyway, already loaded. My brother Don is the same way. His friends come by, and he says, Tell him I'm not here. I ask him why he does that, and he says because they're going down for the girls. I have nothing for the whores. What is there down there for me, he says.
If quiet is a heritable trait, and we got quiet from my father, then we got confidence from my mother. Mom, now she's not quiet. She loves being around people, and is more social and optimistic than my dad. She always just knows that things are going to work out. Loves going to all my ball games. Sometimes she embarrasses me with her yelling, but I'm glad that she's there. She's a reader, too, when she has the time. Zane Gray is her absolute favorite. She has her eccentricities, too. She has a rule for me and my brothers. Don't you eat at anybody's house. Don't you accept anything from them. I guess she doesn't want anybody coming to our place, because she doesn't have anything to give them. But Mother breaks her back to make sure that with our limited money, we always have everything we need. And we do. She makes sure that we have clothes that are as good as the other kids' clothes. And they are. They both drink too much. My father will drink until he runs out of money. Sometimes they get loaded and whoop it up. Once or twice, Pop has run afoul of the law. One night after his shift, my dad and his brother Rob get in a fight down in the bars. And when they come out, the cops are waiting for him. They beat Pop on the head with a sap, a hard leather pouch filled with BBs, and then haul him to jail in Las Vegas. My dad has a nice new scar on his head to show for his night out. Every now and then he'll be too drunk to go to work, and sometimes Mom and Pop fight with each other physically in front of us children. My father can be mean to my mother. After Don and Dale are off at high school, Larry and I sit wide-eyed listening to what goes on on the other side of the closed door. I'm not confessional by nature, so some of these things are surpassing hard for me to say. I love my parents very much. They gave life everything they had, but no child should be raised the way I was raised. The foundation of our house is still there. It would eventually burn down. And that's life in a boom town gone bust. It only follows that in a town where the number one business was prostitution that the leading citizen would be a whoremonger. Not only would Willie Montello let us swim in his pool, but he would hand out $5 bills to kids at Christmas time. My dad used to make fun of him for doing this because five bucks is how much it costs to go with one of Willie's girls. That's so generous, my dad would say. I didn't get my father's sarcasm, so I thought, yeah, it is generous, because a fiver was the most money I'd ever seen in my life. Business was good for Willie, and when military payday came a couple of dimes a month, it seemed like Searchlight would double in size. There'd be men from all over. The clubs catered to nearby Nellis Gunnery School, later to become Nellis Air Force Base, and they catered to Camp Ibis in California, where Patton trained his tank corps, and Camp Desert Rock and Indian Springs Air Force Base, and they catered to the miners, without whom Searchlight would have never existed. In fact, but for the discovery of gold in those waning years of the 19th century, my hometown, the town where I live today, would likely still be a patch of pristine desert. Situated on a rocky, windy, and arid rise without an artisan well or surface water of any kind, the place where searchlight came to be was not a gathering spot for Indian or animal. There was nothing there. Nothing. Fifty-five miles south of Las Vegas, the town is nestled in the southern tip of Nevada. Twenty miles west, along an empty road lined densely with Joshua tree forests, is Nipton, California. Fourteen miles east is Arizona. My father's father came to Searchlight from California to work the mines in about 1902. He had run a confectionery and had been a forest ranger and an itinerant laborer. And the gold strike in southern Nevada must have looked pretty promising to him, if not to everyone else. It's said that the mining camp that became the town of Searchlight got its name when Fred Colton, in describing what he and a couple of other prospectors had found, said, I think I've got something here. And they looked at it harder and said, There is gold there, all right, but it'll take a searchlight to find it. Mark Twain wrote of his own similar strike in Roughing It, the chronicle of his travels to the Nevada Territory. After a great deal of effort, we managed to discern some little fine specks and Judge that a couple of tons of them massed together might make a gold dollar, possibly. We were not jubilant, but Mr. Ballou said that there were worse ledges in the world than that. He saved what he called the richest piece of the rock in order to determine its value by the process called the fire assay. Then we named the mine Monarch of the Mountains. Modesty of nomenclature is not a prominent feature in the mines. 
And so it was in Searchlight 2 that men in the first decade of the 20th century made big boasts and audacious claims. Some got rich and many left poor, and like Twain's mine, the hundreds of shafts sunk into the ground around Searchlight came with names wonderful and weird, names that reflected the characters who would pick up and come to this place. The Chief of the Hills, the Golden Garter, the Silk Stocking, the Red Bird, the Blue Bird, the Philadelphia, the New York, the Spokane, the Dubuque, the June Bug, the Little Bug, and the Cary Nation are only a few of the mines that sprang up in the Searchlight Mining District almost overnight upon Colton's discovery. And the wheeling and dealing and speculation commenced, usually at the saloon. One claim that would become the richest mine in Searchlight was sold for $1,500, a team of mules, a buckboard, and a double-barreled shotgun. Another that produced at least $150,000 in gold changed hands for a pint to Cirrus Noble Whiskey. Ten days before the assessment work on the mine was due, the owner walked into a searchlight bar and shouted, What am I offered for my claim? I'll give you a cigar, came a reply. The offer was accepted. Immediately, the new owner rolled over his new stake. What am I offered for my claim? he shouted. Another miner at the bar responded, I'll give you this bottle of Cirrus Noble. Sold, and the Cirrus Noble mine got its name. Searchlight was a rough-and-tumble mining camp. The work was dangerous, and plenty of men died underground. But the pioneers also made time for entertainment. The Nevada Guide, published by the WPA Writers Project the year after I was born, records a special day in town. On July 4, 1902, for instance, there was a burrow fight. Two Jack Burroughs, noted for their courage, were brought in. Thousands of dollars in various mining claims were wagered on the outcome of their scrap. One of the Burroughs, the property of a desert rat, was named Thunder. The other, a lean, lanky beast, was called Hornet. The two Burroughs squared off on a level area below the camp and raised a dust cloud visible for miles. Thunder had the best of it in the early going, but after Hornet got his second wind, he plied his heels and teeth so well that he drove Thunder into the desert. Thereupon, the men collected their wagers and went to the saloon for the usual celebration. At one point during the boom, lodging ran out and tent hotels began springing up. The local newspaper said, in answer to the urgent demand for accommodations, a number of tent lodging houses are going to be replaced as quickly as possible by wooden structures. It's a long time since there was a tent hotel in Searchlight. A month ago, no one would have patronized such a place. Wooden buildings can't be put up fast enough. In the first decade of the 20th century, the mines swelled the peak population of Searchlight to 3,000. But alone among them, the mighty quartet was actually a world-class operation and really put the town on the map. For a time during the boom, the quartet ran 24-hour operations. The mine would easily yield half the gold that came out of the ground in Searchlight. Initially, things must not have worked out for my grandfather because he left Searchlight in 1910 and went back to California where my father was born at Cajun Pass in 1913. But then the Reeds headed back in 1927, and this time they didn't leave. My father met my mother, whose people were from Sandy, Utah. I learned much later in life that in the distant past, she had been a Mormon. Mom had two sons from another man whom my father would raise as his own. And then, as the next World War got started, came me and my little brother Larry. Dr. Robert Fenlon was there when I was born. He signed the birth certificate, and a few years later he took off for Boulder City, Nevada, which, unlike Searchlight, had a population on the rise. Kids back then were bigger than they are now because there was no such thing as induced labor. And I was a big baby. What my grandmother used to tell me is that I was so big at birth, 10 pounds, that my head was misshapen. She said she worked on my head after I came out like it was molding clay so that it might be a normal shape. It's funny, as you get older, there are lots of people in town who say they were there when you were born. There must have been a hundred people who attended my birth. My father almost didn't live to be one of them. Less than a week before I was born, he was working with a friend, Carl Myers, sinking a vertical shaft owned by the Bimetals Mining Company outside of Kingman, Arizona. These shafts were often hundreds of feet deep driving straight into the ground, 
or on an incline, depending on the vein. Miners would use explosives to push deeper and deeper into the ground. You'd blast at the end of a shift so that by the next day the air would have cleared and then you'd muck or shovel the ore. Blast and muck, blast and muck. Different mines had different setups, but generally there were two buckets. You'd fill one bucket while the hoist man up top was emptying the other and sending it back down. Planting dynamite is something of an art and a science. To be productive, each explosion requires 10 or 12 sticks of dynamite. Say there's an outcropping that shows some promise and you want to investigate. Figure out which way the vein goes, if it gets bigger or peters out. Or, if you need air, you'd have to blast a ventilation shaft so that you'd have circulation. Otherwise, the air got real bad down there. The miners would do all of this on their own, without engineers, all on educated guesses. You drilled holes and put the sticks in place, and the depth and direction of the blast depended on the angle at which you drilled. And here's the main trick. You had to have a dozen different lengths of fuse so that you could stagger and then count the separate explosions. Because if there was one big explosion, it would be impossible to tell if all the charges had gone off before you went back down the hole. So the charges would go off in sequence. A miner had to light the fuses and get far enough up the hole to safety before the blasts started. To move up and down the shaft, a miner would use what's called a sinking ladder. You couldn't leave the ladder at the bottom of the mine because it would get blown to bits when the explosives went off. So miners would carry it with them when they climbed up to escape the blast they set. Myers and my father were down in the shaft setting charges of dynamite when the accident happened. An article in the Tribune Intermountain News from December 1939 tells the rest of the story. Reed had planted 11 charges of powder at the bottom of the 83-foot shaft and lighted all fuses with time enough to allow him to join his partner, Myers, at the station 25 feet above. A runner set off one of those charges prematurely just as Reed started to ascend the ladder, injuring him severely. A doctor said later Reed had approximately 300 rock splinters in his left leg and thigh as a result of the blast. After the first blast, Myers called down to his partner, and when he received no answer, descended the ladder. Every second was precious. Myers knew there were ten more charges, which might explode at any instant, blowing both men to bits. Myers loaded the inert reed on his back and climbed back up the rickety ladder to the station, finding safety behind a muck pile. At almost the instant, the ten remaining charges exploded. Myers then carried his companion out of the shaft and took him to a hospital where physicians said he would recover. When the story got out around Searchlight, somebody said that Carl should get a medal for his bravery. He replied, to hell with the medal. Harry's alive, isn't he? A few months later, Carl Myers did receive the Carnegie Medal for his bravery. He was always a hero to my family. He didn't get up that morning and say, I think I'll be a hero today. But because of what he did that day, my mother didn't become a widow with a newborn, as happened to so many who worked in the mines with my father. For years after my father's near miss, my mother would dig the rocks out of his back. A few years before I was born, my father's brother, Mason, was killed with another miner in an almost identical explosion. My uncle Mason was very handsome and is said to have been the nicest of all the Reed brothers. Mason and the other man, Smokey Pridgen, were killed at the Black Mountain Mine in 1935 when the holes in the tunnel that they were working went off prematurely. A teetotaling man is said to have gotten drunk when he was asked to bring the two bodies out of the tunnel. I had to drink, he said. Those two boys were in pieces. A friend of my father's named Bill Hudgens was killed in a blast in 1940 when a rock fell on his head. Had he not been working alone, he probably would have survived. But after the rock hit him, he tried to climb out of the mine and fell while climbing a ladder. My dad brought him out of the hole. Hudgens left two little children and a pregnant wife. Even with the physical risk and the toll on his body, my dad loved being a miner. He loved it because he was good at it, and because he was more content battling the earth than being around people. Underground, there was no one to avoid. Underground, Pop was consummate and assured. Physically, he was an imposing man, a much bigger man than I am, and it was almost a miracle that Carl Myers could even carry him out of that mine, as my dad outweighed Carl by a lot. 
Most men down in the mine would use a jack leg to brace their jackhammers against a rock facing. My dad thought jack legs were for weaklings. He'd just pick up the jackhammer and go straight into the rock on his own strength. He was also widely known as one of the quickest muckers and one of the few people in the area who could square set timber. It just didn't matter that any day he might not come home. It didn't matter that the work was sporadic and the pay miserable. It didn't matter that my father had the hardest job of any man I've ever known. My father was born to mine, and it was the only thing he wanted to do. It made him happy. And I truly believe that it was one of the few places he was comfortable in this world. At the outbreak of World War II, the mines closed for a time. Gold just wasn't worth mining. And so my dad moved the family and went to work 45 miles north at the plants in Henderson, where they made magnesium for the bombs. The place was called Basic Magnesium, and it was considered a defense installation, so the men working there were exempt from serving in the military. We lived in a little house at 14 East Texas Street, and over the years, Pop became a member of the Laborers, Machinists, and Operators Union. He worked regular eight-hour shifts, had two days off each week, and dressed decently, and a check that didn't bounce came in on a regular basis. We were so happy. One of the other benefits of living in Henderson was that we got to see my brothers, Don and Dale, who were in high school there, since there wasn't a high school anywhere around Searchlight. As Henderson was a company town, they went to basic high school, where Don was on the basketball team. One of my earliest memories is of bugging him to take me to practice with him. He agreed, but he told me that I couldn't get in anyone's way and I couldn't say a word. Not a word. I wasn't older than four or five, and I was so excited. I sat there with a big smile on my face the whole time. The practice ended, the team cleared out the court, the gym lights went out, and I just sat there. My brother was home before he realized that he had left me there in the pitch darkness of the gym. I don't remember getting afraid, but my brother told me not to say anything, so I didn't. Don, who was 12 years older than me, would go away to school and then enlist in the Marines and would come back kind of sophisticated. And with his newfound sophistication, he would teach me things I might not have learned otherwise. It was Don who taught me not to spit. That's crude, he'd say. And it was Don who taught me not to smoke. I was out driving with him on the old railroad grade looking for rabbits, and he was smoking. He had quite a habit by then. I was a young boy, a little older than at basketball practice, but not much older. Well, he was smoking his cools, and I was desperate for a puff. Don, give me a puff, give me a puff, give me a puff. I wouldn't leave it alone, just kept bothering him. Give me a puff. Finally, he said, okay. He took a cigarette and handed it to me. Here's what you do, he said. You take this thing and you suck in just as hard as you can, okay? As hard as you can. Well, I did, and it hurt so bad I can still feel it. He cured me of cigarettes. I never smoked another. Things didn't last for us in Henderson. As soon as the mines opened back up in Searchlight, my dad got out of town. He just wasn't happy there. It seemed as if he just couldn't be satisfied working above ground in a structured environment. That's just who he was. He quit the job with the regular hours and regular pay to go back to the mines of Searchlight, and he took us with him. As kids, we did not understand this, and we were not happy at all about it. But I know that that's what some people do in life. They get good at something and feel comfortable doing it, and even though there may be something out there that's better for them and their family, they're not going to do it because it's not who they are. That was my pop, anyway. He simply had no choice. When I was 11, I started helping my father out in the mines. Like many of the miners in town, he would either lease space or work for someone and get a rate of so much per foot. If he found any gold, the owner would get a percentage on the lease. Most often, he would work alone, even though that was against the law. The mining inspectors rarely came to Searchlight, so he would ask me to keep him company, and I would. I had my own carbide light and my own helmet. My mother would pack us a sandwich. He and I would be down there in the dark and not say much. I panned for gold, and I got pretty good at mucking, and I would watch him work. I was amazed at how quickly he could pound through this impenetrable rock. And man, whatever you did, just stay out of his way down there. 
I spent a lot of time in the mines with him, and the older I got, the more I was able to do. Never got paid for it in anything other than memories. While I loved spending time with my father, I also knew that mining was not the love of my life. After a day's work underground, he and I would both go home filthy. We'd haul our lunch buckets and our gear and climb into the family jalopy. Sometimes I'd get to drive, and my dad would say, Home, James, like he was a fancy man and I was his chauffeur. It was the radio that opened the world to us in Searchlight. My brother and I would huddle in front of our old console. Often the reception was lousy, and if the weather wasn't just right, you were out of luck. But we became devoted to The Shadow, Gunsmoke, and Dragnet. We'd listen to Ronald Reagan and Red Foley, too. And there'd be music, Ernest Tubb, Hank Snow. And in the evenings, when we couldn't pick up anything else, we would listen to a Mexican station, XERL that offered real cowboy music and all manner of magic rings and magic worms for sale. I loved that station and got ripped off by them many times. But without question, the main event on the radio was the Major League Baseball game of the day. Day after day in the summertime, I'd sit riveted by the play-by-play in exotic Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Cleveland. And when the game would be rained out in some far-off city, no one in America would be more disappointed than a kid out in the Nevada desert. The Indians became my team, and I can still easily remember the world championship lineup from 1948. I also followed the Cardinals because Dizzy Dean was the announcer for the game of the day, and Dizzy was a Cardinal. But the big news of the whole era was happening in Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, New York, wherever that was. I can't remember ever seeing a black person in Searchlight. I'm not sure I caught the importance of the event when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. And radio being radio, I'm not sure I even knew that Robinson was black. I can't remember ever seeing a black person in Searchlight. All I cared about was that in 1947, Robinson started in 151 games, batted 297, led the National League in stolen bases, and won Rookie of the Year. And that meant he was great in my book. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I began to realize just what Jackie Robinson had done. I also learned the hell that he had been put through doing it, cursed as a nigger from coast to coast, boycotted by opposing teams, threatened, taking unbelievable abuse, until finally Dodger manager Leo DeRorcher told his team, I don't care if the guy is yellow or black, if he has stripes like a fucking zebra. I'm the manager of this team, and I say he plays. What's more, I say he can make us all rich. And if any of you can't use the money, I'll see that you are all traded. By this time, baseball had become a big part of me and was an important window into the big world for me, and I generally didn't understand. The guy was a great ball player, so why all the name-calling? How come he had to work twice as hard as everybody and put up with all that crap? Obviously, I didn't yet know much about the world, but I was starting to learn. And I did know that we did our fair share of name-calling in Searchlight. In fact, we could compete at the Olympic level in name-calling. Pete Dimitrovich had a big nose, so the whole town, every single person in Searchlight, called him Big Nose Pete. The disabled man was Crippled Jack, and I became known as Pinky. My mother would have nothing to do with the name-calling. I remember one day walking down in front of our house was an old man known to everybody in town as Old Man Rowe. As he walked by the house, I yelled, Hey, old man Roe! My mother came running out of the house with an angry look on her face. You can't call him old man Roe. That's not his name. After that, I still called people names, just not in front of my mother. Searchlight of the late 1940s and 50s was about as far as you could get from Brooklyn and the base path of Ebbets Field. But along with giving me something to dream about on summer afternoons, Jackie Robinson brought to my hometown awareness of a huge struggle that was beginning in America, not with speeches or demonstrations, but with RBIs. In Searchlight, I could listen to the radio and hear about the very beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, and it seemed a million miles away. But I lived for baseball, and while he may have been playing second base 2,500 miles away in Brooklyn, Jackie Robinson was reaching into my town and opening my mind. 
It wasn't until I got older that I understood what a lesson that was. One time, a kid moved in from out of town, which was unheard of. Nice kid. So the first thing I did was pick a fight with him. He was new, and I was jealous of him. He probably dressed decently, was probably well-spoken. He was just different. The typical things that threaten people. Big mistake. The kid could fight. Let's just say that nobody won the fight. And that was the last time I picked a fight with somebody I didn't know. I can still see his face, but I can't remember his name. Later, I'd learned to box so that I could channel my brawling instincts into something more respectable. But in the meantime, I got myself into more fights. When I was in the 8th grade, there was a kid I didn't like very much at all. Compounding this basic problem, his mother also happened to be the teacher. In Searchlight, our schoolhouse was only one room, with 1st through 8th grade crammed together. So, if you didn't like somebody in class, there was no way to avoid them. This made for an uncomfortable situation. The teacher's son knew he had a position of dominance over the rest of us. He knew his mother would always treat him differently, and this delighted him to no end. One day, I'd had enough. I had reached my limit of annoyance with this particular boy and decided to take action. So right there in the classroom, I beat the crap out of the kid in front of all of the other students and his own mother. I did such a good job beating him up that I broke my hand on his hard head. After the fight, I went home cradling my swollen hand. When I got home from school, my dad saw my broken hand. What happened? He said. I got into a fight, I said, and I told him about it. My father wasn't bothered at all that I had started the fight. In fact, after I was finished telling my story, he simply said, Next time, keep your fist closed. That was it. No doctor. No ice, because there was no ice in our house. No more conversation. Just a flattened out knuckle on my right hand, missing ever since that day. I got in lots of fights after that. I always kept my fist closed. By this time, there were fewer than 200 people in town, so there weren't many people my age. But the other children were no less memorable for that. We were one short for a baseball team, so our ninth was a girl, Mary Ann Myers, who was the tomboy at the Searchlight School. She could ride bareback better than most people could ride with a saddle, and played baseball better than some of us boys. Marvin Marshall, who was one of the Marshalls, a big family whose father was an old man married to a young woman, Today, we'd probably call Marvin dyslexic because he didn't read very well. They'd call him out to read and he'd struggle. School wasn't his thing. He needed help, but in Searchlight, there was none. There was Darlene Cree, who was one of the smartest kids in Searchlight. She'd been kind of a roustabout, but married a devout Mormon and converted. She had a half-brother, Junior Cree, who was much older than Darlene. Junior got shot in the ass in Europe in World War II. He had been in the Italian campaign and in North Africa and was in the third or fourth wave going into Normandy. He still runs a trailer park in town. And others in our town also went off to the Great War. My dad's youngest brother, Doug, was a tank gunner in Europe. I remember when he came home from the war, he brought a German helmet, a sword, and binoculars, and we got to play around with them. My uncle Jeff was in Okinawa. We were so proud of our searchlight soldiers and so happy that they made it back home. Searchlight School was actually two rooms, grades 1 through 4 in one room and 5 through 8 in the other. The idea was that you'd graduate from one room to the next. But by the time I was old enough to be an upperclassman, we didn't have enough kids in the school, and we had only one teacher. So all grades, all subjects were taught in that one room, which made it tough if you didn't like somebody or if you struggled in any way, especially with reading. I was lucky to read well. My favorite author was Jack London, who wrote Call of the Wild and White Fang. I never traveled out of searchlight. We never went any place. Once in a while to Henderson, rarely to Las Vegas. I was 12 years old before I went to Needles, California, which was only 50 miles away. But even though I never left searchlight, I traveled everywhere in my mind's eye. My favorite place to go was the Yukon, and Jack London took me there. Math was another story. I was a whiz at basic addition and subtraction, but nothing more abstract than that. Part of the problem was that it was almost impossible to keep teachers in searchlight. They'd come, and then they'd get out of town pretty quickly. But the one teacher that spent several years there was named Mrs. Pickard. She taught all eight grades and was the picture of a rural school teacher. Glasses, black hair tied back in a bun, single. 
I can't remember one thing she taught me, not one. But she was the first person to teach me that it was good to learn. She was the person who instilled in me the desire to read. Teachers didn't get paid much, and they had to move to the middle of nowhere, and they had to put up with kids like me, so you probably couldn't blame them for not wanting to stick around. And back in those days, all these tiny remote towns had their own school districts, so there was no support from Clark County or Las Vegas or the state. We were on our own, but Mrs. Pickard bucked the trend and stayed in Searchlight for several years, which was lucky for us. Larry and I are less than two years apart, so we were at Searchlight School at the same time. On Larry's 10th birthday, we were on our Schwinn's about to leave for school when Mom said, Today, you're going to come home for a special birthday lunch, and you don't have to go back to school. And it was Friday, October 31st, Halloween, so we'd be off for the weekend. Because it was a special day, I got cut in on the deal, too. When lunchtime came, we raced home as fast as we could go down that dirt road to get home for that special lunch. It sure seemed like it was important at the time, and Mom's not home. What's this? She's not here, I turned to Larry and said to Larry. She's probably up at Daisy's. Daisy had been a family friend for as long as we could remember. Larry, run up there on your bike and check. And Larry tore out after her and hit some gravel going too fast, and he went sliding off the hill and lost control, flipped his bike and broke his leg. He could get up, but kept falling down. He didn't realize what he had done, but he wasn't going to be able to walk on that leg, so he was crawling back up the hill and kept hollering after me, Pink! Pink! I was in the house, and he finally got my attention, and I opened the door and could see him lying on the side of the road. In that special way that only brothers can be brutal to each other, I thought he was fooling around. What are you doing? You're supposed to get Mom at Daisy's for birthday lunch. Larry said that he had broken his leg. Stop kidding around, I said. Get back on your bike and go get Mom. I'm hungry. And I let the door slam and went back in the house. Larry went back to dragging himself up the hill and was so convincing as an invalid that eventually I figured he wasn't faking and decided to help him into the house. So much for that special lunch. As we made our way inside, he was in so much pain that to this day I remember his screaming any time he tried to move. There was a part-time nurse in town, one of the Hughes family. She came to check out the leg and pronounced it broken. When Pop came home from work, he quietly went to talk to Larry. Are you in pain, son? He said. Do you need to go to the doctor? No, Larry replied. This was just as well, because Searchlight had no doctor. The nearest would have been at St. Rose de Lima Hospital in Henderson, or maybe Boulder City. But even if we'd had the best doctor in the country, there was no money for it. Larry would be laid up lame for weeks. Because he was ten, he mended pretty quickly and was hopping around the house on one leg before too long. But the leg was never set and healed crooked. Larry always had a sense of humor about it, though and says that he blames his lack of football prowess on that busted leg. It wasn't just us. No one saw the doctor. If a medical condition simply couldn't be ignored, most often the afflicted had to take matters into their own hands. My parents both had terrible teeth. My dad's teeth would hurt him so much, and when the pain became unbearable, he'd pull him out with vice grips. He said it didn't hurt as bad as the toothache. My mother had a few teeth, but one by one they fell out. She had to gum her food. She couldn't eat the meat we had. We ate a lot of potatoes, rice, and beans. That always bothered me, and I'm confident that it must have bothered her. So later in high school, when I started working and earning a little money, I wanted to get my mother some teeth. I knew there was a big-shot dentist in Las Vegas named J.D. Smith, who had married a woman from Searchlight. I went to his office and told him I would like to get my mother some teeth, and he just looked at me and said, You know, there's no credit. I was so insulted that I just walked right out of there. I wasn't looking for credit. To hell with you, I thought. Next, I went to Paul Marshall, who was a dentist in Henderson. I had no connection with him, but I wanted to help my mother. I said, Dr. Marshall, I want to get my mother some teeth. She has no teeth. He said, well, it'll cost you about $250. I said, fine, and I got my mother teeth. There are a lot of people, even today, just like my mother, people who can't get their teeth taken care of or have health problems that they ignore because there's nothing else to be done. No money, no transportation. So they do like my mother. Can't worry about it, she'd say. 
and maybe have a drink or two. In Searchlight, we made do in other ways, too. When I was ten, a huge fire ravaged what was left of downtown Searchlight, burning, among other things, the grocery store. It was never rebuilt, and I honestly can't remember where we got food after that. We obviously got it somewhere. I'm not sure where. Around that time, my father told me I could go hunting. My older brothers each had a twenty two rifle. Searchlight at the time had no place to buy a bullet. I had this bolt-action rifle that belonged to my brother. It held seven shells. I had none. So I rummaged around in some drawers and found two bullets, a twenty-two long and a twenty-two short. My grandmother told me that if I could get a jackrabbit, she would cook it for us. So I left my house in search of rabbits and was walking down a wash at sunset when I saw him there, sitting on his haunches. I shot and missed, but the rabbit didn't move. I shot again, my last shell, and I hit the rabbit, but I didn't kill him, so I gave chase. I chased and chased that rabbit, seemed like for hours. I was tired, he was wounded, but I was gaining on him. I got that rabbit, took it home, skinned it, took it to my grandmother, and she fixed this wonderful rabbit stew, enough for everybody. Cooked it on the wood stove in the house where I was born. Best rabbit I ever ate. I think the chase must have made it taste better. We figured we could make do with nothing, and half the time, we did. As a boy, I had to work for a living. Come summer, I would work with Sharky Myers at his corral. Sharky was a rodeo cowboy, and the son of the man who had saved my father's life. He was a nice-looking guy, and had a good personality and a real way with women. He dated Miss Hel Dorado, Joanne Sunquist. The Miss Heldorado contest was a beauty pageant, but instead of the bathing suit competition, they showcased horseback riding skills. Sharky was quite a bit older than me, by at least five years, and he always took such good care of me. I don't know why, but he did. We'd go down to Spirit Mountain, south of town, where Sharky and his father Carl kept their cattle. Sharky had built what he called an arena. He cleared a spot and arranged railroad ties in a big circle, put up fencing, and built cattle chutes like a real rodeo. I'd haul water and clean out stalls. Spirit Mountain was a magical place. You can see it from great distance, glistening blue. The Indians were the first to call it Spirit Mountain, and if you've seen it, you'd know why. I worked with Sharky for several summers in addition to my other jobs. Cowboy work is hazardous, and Sharky got hurt a few times. Once, he got hit in the face with a windless crank, so he was all scarred up. I used to go with him to Hell Dorado with his parents, and we'd have a shoot pass, so we'd sit where the cowboys were with the horses and other animals. I was always afraid of horses and cattle, but I never let on. He would rope the calves, and it was my job to untie them, which I just hated because I've never felt comfortable around big animals. I had many other jobs as a kid. I did a lot of digging. For a cowboy named Queen... I dug trenches for a water line. I dug post holes with another guy for a power line that was coming in. He couldn't speak a word of English, and I didn't know a word of Spanish. But we worked side by side for three weeks and communicated just fine. Once in a while, I'd help my dad dig graves at the Searchlight Cemetery, which is a wonderful place. Started in 1906, at the peak of the boom. Sometimes he'd get paid, sometimes he wouldn't. He'd take a pick and shovel to the rocky ground, if it was too rocky, he'd single jacket and dynamite the earth open. And I drove a truck, too. Of course, there was no such thing as a driver's license for a 13-year-old, and this job tested my skills pretty severely. Some men were drilling a well, and a well needs water, so I drove the water truck. My first time on the job was at night, and I missed my turn off on a steep, narrow road. It was a hot summer night, and I was pouring sweat. The steering wheel was wet, my shirt was soaked, I brought the big truck heavy with water to a slow stop. There was no room to turn around. I knew I'd have to back it up. I had never done anything remotely like this before. I can't say how long it took, but it seemed like forever before I got back to the road. When I got back to the job, men didn't want to hear my excuses. They were angry that I had taken so long. It was just after this that I rolled our 42 Mercury and totaled it. And that's what they got for letting a kid drive. It was a nice car, too. We didn't always have cars. My dad once had a brand new Studebaker, but it was repossessed after six months. In the Mercury, I was driving my cousin Jeff and my brother Larry down to the river and was going too fast. Nobody cared about the car, though. 
As poor as we were, my parents didn't care. They never said a cross word about it. They were just relieved that nobody was hurt too badly. But my life wasn't all work. There were times of actual joy, and even the rough-and-tumble characters of Searchlight could be kind. I remember a man named Willett Barton. He killed a man in a claim jump deal. Somebody had tried to take his mine away from him, and Willett shot him. People were kind of afraid of him, I guess because all the kids had heard that he was a killer. Willett liked me for some reason, and in this little yard of his he cultivated figs. He had two trees, and this man who had such a fearsome reputation would share his figs with me. I don't really know why. Maybe it's because I wasn't afraid of him, but I didn't care why. I just loved the figs, and I couldn't believe that something so sweet could be born of the hard rocks beneath our feet. Pop Payne, who made the star on the ceiling of the front room of our house, would cut my hair and fill me with stories of his life as a major league umpire. This meant that he'd been to all those places I had heard about on the radio, and it made Pop Payne a very important person in my world as I lived and breathed baseball. A man named Elwin Kent would also come by the house with his hand clippers and cut our hair. He had polio and was hunchbacked. Every now and then, my father and his friends would pick up Elwin by his hands and feet and try to stretch him out to get rid of his ump. Elwin was always of good cheer about this, and my dad and his friends meant well, but it didn't work, of course. For music, my Uncle Doug could play the steel guitar, and my mother would sing every chance she got, even at funerals. My dad would make fun of her. He'd say, Somebody died, so now you can sing. I'm sure he was just jealous because she had the most pleasant voice. I, on the other hand, could not sing. Even my mother said so. She'd say, Okay, at the Christmas program, just move your lips, or you'll get a beating when you get home. So I would move my lips, but I wouldn't sing a word. I only got one spanking from my mother, but she threatened me a lot. My dad never gave me a spanking. On weekends, a western band would come through town. One of the whorehouses, the Searchlight Casino, would be converted into a dance hall for the night, and the grown-ups would go swing dancing or square dancing. Searchlight had no town hall and no place for people to gather. When I was a little boy, somebody found an old second-hand building somewhere and hauled it to town. It was pretty rickety, just one big room, and it became our town hall. It was pretty nice, and it's where I saw my first movie. Once in a blue moon, some kind person with the school district would get a two-reeler, always a western, often Roy Rogers, and we were convinced that life didn't get any better. And then Christmas would come. My mother would have done anything to make sure that we kids had Christmas. She would beg and borrow, and I can remember that more than once she got the postmistress to open the post office in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve so that we could get our packages. She would delay buying them because she would have to scrape money together to pay the COD or cash on delivery. In those days, when you'd order from a catalog, to pick up your merchandise, you'd need to pay the postmistress. And the annual Sears catalog was always a major cultural event at our house. Everything that existed in the wide world was in that book. Everything. Fancy clothes, baseball stuff. We'd pore over it, studying it to see how those other people out there lived. It's hard to describe the pleasure this gave us. It was almost as good as Jack London. But mostly we just looked at it and dreamed, because we never ordered much out of it. But when you did get a gift from the catalog or elsewhere, you hung on to it, no matter how short it was or how badly it fit or how it wasn't your favorite color. To this day, I hate to return a gift, because when I was a kid, we didn't return gifts. When you get a gift, you say thank you. And if it doesn't fit, you make do. On top of all else, Searchlight taught me this. When you get your hands on something, you keep it. And when Christmas was over, the catalog doubled as toilet paper. One day when I was about 14, my dad obviously had something to drink. It was summer because I was home from first year away at high school in Henderson. It was daytime. He was being mean to my mother. He started hitting her. That was it. I just looked over at my brother and said, Larry, let's take him. So we did. We jumped on him. I took him high, Larry took him low, and we pinned him to the floor. He was like a rock. My father was a big man, and I had always been afraid of him. Get off of me, he yelled as he kicked and writhed. Down in the mines, my father was more than a match for solid rock. I had never conceived of a physical task he couldn't do. 
except on that afternoon in searchlight, he couldn't get my brother and me off of him. Stay down, I said. My father lived a hard life. He wasn't a bad man, but I'd be damned if he was going to do that to my mother again. It was the first time we had ever done anything like that. We'd never been big enough. We didn't want to hurt him. We didn't want to hit him. But we took him down and weren't about to let him up. No, oh, he was mad. Being challenged under his own roof like that, he struggled there on the floor, cursing the ceiling. For 15 minutes it went on like this. All of a sudden, he stopped struggling and started laughing, which we thought was kind of odd. Larry said, What are you laughing about, Pop? He said, You have to let me up sooner or later. We may have been big enough to take him down by then, but we were still afraid of him, and he knew it. But then, in silence, we all got to our feet. I figured there was a good chance that Larry and I were going to get it. But to my surprise and relief, nothing happened. My father understood physical strength. That's the world I was raised in. He judged people by what they could do physically, and he taught me to do the same. Larry and I were becoming men, and he wouldn't be able to carry on like that in front of us anymore. Those days were over. We had taken him down, and he would never look at us the same again. As my father left the room, I caught my mother in the corner of my eye. She had what I remember to be a look of pride on her face. Looking back, I realized that this was when my father began to seem kind of old to me, even though on the calendar he wasn't that old at all. Things just began to catch up with him. A few years later, all my brothers and I were home in searchlight for a family gathering of some kind. We were grown, so the kitchen was smaller than ever, and we were standing around talking when we look up, and there's my dad, stark naked. I guess he had been drinking or something, and got up, and there he was. Now to everybody there, I don't think it meant anything, and it shouldn't have to me either, but damn, I was humiliated for him. It was just family. I shouldn't have cared that much, but I did. There was my father, and in such a state. That's why, and I'm sure it's not fair, but that's why I've never had much sympathy for people saying, the reason I'm so screwed up is because my parents are screwed up. I would have been stone sober if my parents hadn't have done this or had only taken me out to church more often. That's probably a shortcoming on my part, but I'm just not very sympathetic to those kinds of stories. I guess some people might consider it to be kind of an unusual background, but this is where I develop my values. Much attention is paid in public life to the importance of the collection of attributes that we call character. Somewhat less attention is devoted to consideration of where character is born, but I suppose you could say that searchlight gives the lie to some of the prevailing theories. I'm here as a witness to say that character and values come from places you wouldn't necessarily think to look. Because some of the men and women of greatest character that I will ever meet in my life came from this place of hard rocks and inhospitable soil. Trace the footsteps back far enough in any one story, and you'll find a pioneer. These are the pioneers in my story. Why they came here to searchlight is rather easy to understand. Why they stayed and persevered is maybe a little harder. Mining the earth is just about the hardest job under the sun, and when the returns begin to dwindle, the gold is less plentiful, and the checks start to bounce, I guess it might seem to a hard rock miner like my father that the earth itself is fighting back, exacting its revenge. Like a lot of young people, I was quite frankly embarrassed about my home, my family, where I came from, and it wasn't until much later in life that I came to the realization that who I was, who I am, is best understood by looking at the tiny high desert town of Searchlight. It took many years for me to come to this, because that part of my life I had always put away somewhere. I didn't want anyone to know that I came from that little place that only had one teacher and no indoor toilets. That wasn't something that I would ever talk about. But as time went on, I was drawn back to my hometown, and I started talking about it. This awareness, of course, is not unique. We all have our homecomings, and this was mine. I suppose when you leave a place, reject it, you begin to see it clearly, maybe for the first time. You begin to hear its voices, and maybe even appreciate what it was you were so determined to leave. My temporary estrangement from my hometown when I was a younger man has its roots in 
many of the things that I now love most about Searchlight. In modern-day America, it was remote, very quiet, an outpost from the complicated world. Its physical desolation was and is stunningly beautiful. And the people there are special characters. When I was a boy, we had a burly lawman in town, a deputy sheriff named John Silveria. He was known and feared for his toughness. He didn't worry about being nice. If he got out of line, Big John served as judge, jury, parole, and probation officer all in one. But he was the object of more hero worship than fear. Every kid in Searchlight seemed to want to be like him. But it wasn't Big John who made sure that my life of crime was brief. It was Willie Martello, the whoremonger. It went like this. When I was in high school, sophomore or junior year, a friend of mine named Ron McAllister and I came over from Henderson, and we were kicking around in searchlight with not much to do, and we noticed cases of redeemable bottles stacked up behind a casino. Well, we looked at them and saw dollar signs. We just stole them, as many as we could carry, a case of them, two cases, the perfect crime committed in broad daylight. The next time I saw Willie, he had a serious expression on his face that I wasn't used to seeing. He looked at me and said, You know, I saw you steal those bottles, so I could have gotten you in big trouble. Pinky, you should never steal anything from anybody. I didn't get you in trouble because I think you could amount to something. Don't you do stuff like that. And I remember that always. It was a good lasting lesson for me. It may sound unusual, but I didn't get many of those kinds of lessons from my parents. They never taught me things about basic honesty. Maybe that's why I had to learn about it from a whoremonger. But this lesson, my mother did teach me, and it's the most important thing I've ever learned. She taught me to have confidence when sometimes I have no business having confidence. She taught me that no one was better than me, even if it wasn't true. She taught me that I could handle anything that the world could throw at me whatever it might be.